Hello and welcome back. We're still talking about Faust and today we're going to look at the part when he returns from the forest and cave and finally takes Gretchen in his arms and... Wait a second. Where is that part? Gotcha! So at this point in the story, we begin to see huge gaps in our text, and you'd think after taking 60 years to write this play, Goethe could have, you know, included all of the main details, but he leaves things out. And that may get more and more frustrating for us as we get to the end of part one. In between Gretchen's chamber, where she was pining away for him and his being gone for so long, and the March's Garden scene, which is the very next scene, a whole lot happens. In short, he returns from being away, he gets together with Gretchen, they have a relationship, and it goes on for some months before we get any more information. We jump straight into them being really already very close and having spent a whole lot of time together. And so in this part of the story, we return to Gretchen and Faust together in Marta's garden. And this appears to be their meetup place now. And it opens with them in conversation, and Gretchen is quizzing Faust about religion. And this is interesting, because after all, isn't she sort of breaking her own moral code at this time? So why is she so worried about his moral well-being? This may be part of that innate tendency in us to really be more concerned about the well-being of the ones we love than ourselves. Here she is, worried that Faust's soul is going astray. After all, he doesn't attend church, he doesn't seem to do any sort of religious-y things, and ultimately what she's really bothered by is the fact that he hangs out with this super creepy guy named Mephistopheles. Now she doesn't know that he's the devil, but he sure makes her uncomfortable. When she finally explains her fears to Faust after their conversation about religion for a little while, she says, that man from whom you never part is hateful to me in my inmost heart. Nothing in all my life has stabbed me to my soul as with a knife, like that man's horrid leer. His presence rouses up my blood. I find almost every person good, but as I long to see you night and morning, he makes my hackles rise in secret warning. What's more, I take him for a knave as well. God pardon me if I should judge him ill. She feels guilty for judging Mephistopheles. She feels guilty for thinking bad of him, but yet he makes her so very uncomfortable. And even though she longs to be with Faust, every time she's around Mephistopheles, she feels really bad. She goes on to say, I would not mingle with his kind. He's hardly through the door to me. He puts on that face, half mockery, half grim. One knows there's nothing rouses sympathy in him. You read on his brow as on a scroll that he cannot love a single soul. I come to feel so blissful in your arm, so warmly yielding, free and calm, but his presence chills my heart with loathing. I am so overcome. Let him just enter and survey us. I fancy all my love for you grows numb, nor could I in his presence say my prayers. And that just cuts my heart in two. Oh, Heinrich! You must feel it too. She feels his evil influence. Every time he walks into the room, it makes her feel as if she can't love or pray or do anything good. And she's bothered that the man she loves with all her heart is spending all of his time with this guy. Faust rather obnoxiously just patronizes her. Dear baby, have no fear. It takes all kind of folk you'll find. Ah, oh, tender angel of foreboding. He completely dismisses all of her fears, even though they're really well-founded, and he should know. And he calls her dear baby and tender angel, and really condescending terms. You also may have noticed that she calls him Heinrich throughout this whole scene and throughout the rest of the play, which is a little bit odd, because in the traditional legend, his name was Johann. Now, maybe Goetz is just mixing things up, or maybe this reveals that Faust is not being very honest with her. Remember how we talked about truth and lies? Well here, maybe he didn't even give her his correct name. He's given her some false name. But it's also important to note what Faust actually says about religion, what he believes in. There's a very key speech about that. At first it sounds like he's totally quibbling. He says, oh, who could really believe in God? And she says, so you don't believe? And he turns it around and explains what he means. He says, do not mishear me, dear my heart, for who may name him and go proclaiming, yes, I believe in him. And who search his heart and dares say for his part, No, I believe him not. The all-comprising, the all-sustaining, does he comprise, sustain not you, me, himself? Are not the vaulted heavens hung on high? It, is earth not anchored here below? And do with kindly gaze eternal stars on rise aloft? Join eye not eye to eye with thee? Does not all surge into thy head and heart, and in perpetual mystery unseenly visible weave beside thee? Fill full your heart, all it will hold with this, and when you're all suffused and lost in bliss, then call it what you will. 
Call it fulfillment, hard love, God. I have no name for it. Feeling is all. Name is but sound and fume befogging heavens and blaze. So his point is that who can really label God, put a name on God and say, this is God, I know who he is. But also who can really say, there is no God. It almost sounds like he's agnostic at first, but then he gets a little bit more specific. He lays out some of his arguments, which may sound kind of familiar as key arguments for why he believes a God must exist, a creator, some sort of force behind all the universe. Are not the vaulted heavens hung on high? Is not earth he anchored here below? And do with kindly gaze eternal stars not rise aloft? In other words, looking at the cosmos, looking at the universe, certainly there must be some sort of force behind all of this, some sort of creative force that, that brought this into existence. His second argument continues. Join I not eye to eye with thee, does not all surge into thy head and heart, and in perpetual mystery unseenly visible weave beside thee. So when we look into each other's eyes, don't we feel something deep and meaningful and, and powerful? And he describes being filled with this feeling. And then you call that feeling whatever you like. You can call it fulfillment, heart, love, God, doesn't matter. It's the feeling that matters. So when you're deeply overwhelmed by an intense feeling that seems to be beyond yourself, outside of yourself, that might be what you mean by God. This argument returns to one of the key arguments Faust has been making all along, the difference between language and true meaning. He doesn't like a label or a name for God because that's using language. That's trying to categorize him. Instead, just go with the feeling. So extremely romantic. Feeling is all. Name is but sound and fume, befogging heaven's blaze. When we put a name on God, we just befog it. We just confuse the issue. Let's just feel it. This idea about religion is really Faust's idea about everything, right? We saw earlier when he was arguing with Mephistopheles the difference between the truth and a lie is how much you feel it's true. So if you sincerely and deeply feel it as you're saying it, it's the truth, even if you completely change your mind five minutes later. And God is that true feeling that you really feel. The problem here with Romanticism and the problem here with the idea of trusting your feelings is the fact that there are consequences to not having any rational grounding whatsoever. And we're definitely going to see those consequences very shortly. Gretchen accepts this speech because, well, one, it's kind of confusing, but also it just sounds like lofty spiritualism. So she says, all well and good, the turn of phrase is something different, but I presume what Parson says means much the same. Kind of sounds like what some Parson would say, I guess. Okay, I'll take it. Maybe she's accepting it because, after all, she just really wants him to be religious. She wants him to be okay so that she can love him. But now it's time for Gretchen to go, and Faust does that sort of whole, Oh, I can't wait to see you again. Oh, I miss you already. And Gretchen says, Oh, if only I could invite you into my house and we could sleep together tonight. But there's a problem. She lives with her mom, who would definitely overhear things. Oh, if only I slept alone. I'd gladly leave my door unlocked tonight, but any little thing will wake my mother. And if she found us with each other, I would just perish at her sight. But Faust has a solution for everything. He says, You angel, this is no sore plight. Here's a flask. Here is a flask. Three drops to take, mixed with her drink, will steep her nature in profoundest sleep. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Faust just gave her a sleeping potion to drug her mom so they can sleep together. That is definitely not okay. Did we just mention the whole problem with trusting your feelings? Gretchen wants to do anything Faust asks her, and she says, what would I not do for your sake? Uh, it's a pretty important question. But she does wonder if it's going to be okay, and she says she will take no harm from it. And Faust said, would I advise it, darling, if she would? It's coming from me. You know the source. Although, is it really coming from Faust? I mean, where has he gotten this from? Presumably Mephistopheles. It comes from the devil, baby. It's okay. Of course it's harmless. <laughs> and, and, and Gretchen says, okay, I'll drug my mom. She says, just looking at you, dearest man, what drives me to your will, I wish I knew. With all I have already done, I've precious little left to do for you. What would I not do for your sake? With all I've already done, I've precious little left to do for you. Those words are kind of haunting. She is so deeply enamored with him and so willing to do anything he asks her, even crazy things like drug her own mother. She's already sleeping with him, now she's drugging her mom. What is the breaking point? At which point will she say, no, I can't do that? Is there going to come a time when she'll finally refuse what Faust asks of her? 
we will see. The scene concludes with Gretchen leaving and Mephistopheles popping his head in and being like, well that was entertaining. Faust is rather irritated that he's spying, but Mephistopheles was, you know, having a good time. He pokes fun at Faust for uh, the way he answered her questions about religion, and Faust feels kind of guilty, maybe? You monster! You cannot conceive how this pure, faithful deer bred to implicit trust in faith and to believe its soul salvation writhes in holy fear to see him she holds dearest damned and lost. It's so sweet how she's concerned about my soul, which I'm selling to the devil. And Mephistopheles says, wow, she was really clever. She figured out that I was the devil, pretty much. How weird is that? And we conclude with, again, the hint towards what's going to happen tonight. How is their relationship going to progress? What's going to happen next? Is Gutsa going to leave out many more huge details? We'll find out next time in probably the most exciting part of the book, the next few scenes. The Disney song for this particular section is from The Lion King. Can you feel the love tonight? Words are so confusing Bouncing in your brain When you're searching for the meaning Words just can't contain There's a better method And it sees me through it's enough for my heart to tell me I should be with you. And can you feel the feels tonight? Feeling feels is all. You know I never steer you wrong. So answer my heart's call. tonight if your words are true your love will keep me safe forever if i give my heart to you when i say i love you in the moment i'm sincere you know that i feel true tonight when i hold you here the thing about emotions, the powerful and strong, what good is it to measure them and ask how much, how long? Can you feel the feels tonight? This is where we are. And it's enough for this wandering scholar that you'll go this far. Thanks for watching. Click up here to watch the previous video, or click here to watch the next video, or you can click down here to subscribe. And I'll see you next time when we explore the next four scenes, which will be very, very dramatic.